Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I'm Leela Fernandez. I'm a professor at the University of Washington, and I'm here to welcome you from the Jackson School. Um, I'd like to begin today's event by um, acknowledging on, the, on behalf of the Jackson School and the and U University of Washington that we are on Coast Salish, Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, the Suquamish, the Tulalip, and the Muckleshoot nations and other natives people, peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, indigenous nations, and people across the world. So I'd like to welcome you to the inaugural event of the Jackson School. We're um, extremely excited uh, for this first event. Event. Let me begin by thanking our co-sponsors, the Center for Western European Studies, the Ellison Center for Russian, East European, and Central Asian Studies, the Jean Monnet Center for Excellence, and the Center for Global Studies at the University of Washington. Um, it's my great delight, my great pleasure to introduce Ambassador Burns, uh, Nicholas Burns. Uh, I know that he in many ways needs no introduction. Um, he has had such a distinguished career uh, in terms of his leadership and service in government, nonprofit, the nonprofit world and in higher education. Uh, Ambassador Nicholas Burns is a Goodman Professor of the Practice of Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, he is faculty chair of the Future of D Diplomacy Project and also the Project on Europe and the transatlantic relationship at the Kennedy School's Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Ambassador Burns is also executive director of the Aspen Strategy Group and Aspen Security Forum and senior counselor at the Cohen Group. He is chairman of the board of Our Generation Speaks, which seeks to bring together young Palestinians and Israelis in common purpose. Ambassador Burns, as I'm sure all of you know, has served in the United States government for 27 years as a career foreign service officer. He was Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs from 2005 to 2008, U.S. Ambassador to NATO from 2001 to 2005, U.S. Ambassador to Greece from 1997 to 2001, and State Department spokesman from 1995 to 1997. He worked on the National Security Council as Senior Director for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia Affairs, Special Assistant to President Clinton, and Director for Soviet Affairs for George, President George H.W. Uh, Bush. Ambassador Burns served in the American Consulate General in Jerusalem, where he coordinated, coordinated U.S. economic assistance to the Palestinian people in the West Bank. He was also a member of Secretary of State John Kerry's Foreign Affairs Policy Board from 2014 to 2017. Perhaps not surprisingly, he has received both the Presidential Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary of State State's Distinguished Service Award. In addition to his distinguished record um, in, in, uh, in governmental service, he's also had amassed a massive record of distinction uh, in the public service um, and nonprofit world. Um, he serves on the boards of innumerable uh, nonprofit organizations, and there is no way for me to list them all. So I'm just going to mention a selected few, uh, probably those which um, struck me as uh, pretty, uh, in terms of my own uh, particular passions. Uh, he served on uh, the Special Olympics International um, Board, the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, Refugees International, the Atlantic Council, America Abroad Media, the NATO Cyber Se Center of Excellence, and he's also a member of the Committee on Conscience of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, beyond that, within the realm of higher education, Professor, uh, Professor Burns has received 15 honorary degrees, the 2017 Ignatian Award for, from Boston College, the 2016 New England of the Year for, uh, Award from the New England Council, the Woodrow Wilson Award for Public Service from Johns Hopkins University, the Boston College Alumni Achievement Award, and the Jean Mayer Global Citizenship Award from Tufts University. He serves on the Board of Trustees of Boston College and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the Council on Foreign Relations. And he's also a fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society. Closer to home, I have to mention that Ambassador Burns is actually part of the work that we do in training students. For example, at the Jackson School, our faculty member, um, Chris Jones, um, teaches a has taught a course uh, just recently in the 2020 winter quarter where he assigned a study of NATO's problems by, by Ambassador Burns um, and General Douglas Lute. And I believe that um, Chris Jones attempts, is planning to do something similar again. So, um, so both globally, nationally, and um, very close to home, Ambassador Burns has had a tremendous impact. 
And so I'm really, really delighted to welcome you, Ambassador Burns, to the Jackson School as our first speaker of the year. And actually, this um, um, as I just joined the uh, Jackson School as director, moving here from the University of Michigan, my first inaugural, inaugural event as director. And um, today, Ambassador Burns is going to speak on the crisis in transatlantic trans relations and other global challenges. Thank you so much. Professor Fernandez, thank you so much. That was a very warm introduction, and I'm sorry that we had to go on so long. Um, but uh, it was very kind of you, and congratulations on your becoming director of the Jackson Institute and the Jackson School. And I'm really happy to be back at the University of Washington under your auspices. So thank you for the welcome. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. I'm looking forward to a good conversation with students and uh, with faculty. I'm, I'm not a stranger. Uh, to Seattle and to the University of Washington. I have a very close friend, Ambassador John Koenig, who's teaching at UW, and uh, he invited me to speak four years ago when I was uh, temporarily at Stanford as a fellow. And we, my wife and I just um, really love Seattle, Washington and the state of Washington. It's a beautiful city. It's one of our most impressive, I think, cities in the United States. And, and UW really impressed me. Uh, and the global focus of UW especially was very impressive. So I'm happy to be with you. I'm sorry it can't be in person. I'm sorry we've got to have a virtual meeting, but that's, that's our fate in the coronavirus world. I also wanted to thank uh, Frank Kuzminski, who's a new PhD student at the Jackson School. And Frank was um, with us at Harvard Kennedy School uh, back in 2011 and 2012. And we exchanged emails the other day. I think he's happy to be uh, up in Seattle and at, at UW. So you've got some great people on the faculty and great students. I should also say, I'm not just trying to ingratiate myself with the state of Washington audience, but I'm a big New England Patriots fan. And this is a really down year for us. And so the team I really like beyond my team, the Patriots is the Seahawks and Russ, I like Russell Wilson. So if we can't win, maybe the Seahawks can win this year. How's that for a good prediction? Um, what I wanna do tonight is talk about uh, the crisis in the transatlantic relationship. And I wanna talk about NATO and the European Union and the big trade relationship we had with Europe, but particularly what should we be doing Europe and America vis-a-vis -vis the Indo-Pacific and, and, and the Middle East and Africa, because we have common work, uh, South Asia, that we need to do in each of those areas. But before I do, I really do think that foreign policy has to begin at home in 2020 and 2021. Um, we're all anticipating this big event uh, next Tuesday, November 3rd. Uh, I'm, not, I'm gonna be very transparent with you. I'm, I'm supporting Joe Biden. Uh, I've been an advisor on his campaign for 18 months. I believe in him. I think we need a new leader. And particularly on these issues, Professor, I think um, we've got to think very seriously about how to revive uh, the United States and our influence overseas in our leadership role. But before we do anything, whether it's going to be President Trump in a second term, if he's reelected, or Vice President Biden, President Biden in a first term, we've got to look within. Because there's no question, I think all of us feel as Americans, we're facing the most daunting collection of problems, probably since Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in 1932. If you think about the pandemic and, and the fact that in 46 states, we have now mounting infections and mounting deaths. We're definitely in the second wave. It's not going to get e any easier. I'm no expert on public health, but I try to listen to people who are, and most people think we're not going to fully come out of this until 2022. And so the American people need a government in, in Washington, and of course, state governments in all 50 states who can help us through this. And we certainly, in my view, need, need more discipline in the country on mask wearing and social distancing and following the dictates and the advice of the Center for Disease Control. And, and that's one big crisis that unites all of us. We're worried about our families. We're worried about our friends. We're, we can't fully have university life, either at UW or at Harvard uh, because of this pandemic. We'll still be online, mostly at Harvard in this, what we call the spring semester. It's really the winter semester in the first part of 2021. So think about that crisis that has done enormous damage to our country, uh, 225,000 Americans dead, Johns Hopkins, which is really the center of uh, epi epidemiological knowledge and prediction, thinks we might be at 400,000 dead Americans by the beginning 
of 2021, just a couple of months from now, this on it by its own would be a crisis of a lifetime for most Americans. And then you twin it with the fact that uh, we're in a big recession. Uh, economists, many economists think it might get worse before it gets better. If this second wave continues for a long time, uh, the economy is going to continue to be in a downturn. A lot of uh, lower income and middle income Americans are going to hurt, particularly those without access to health care. The entire twin uh, crisis between the economy and the coronavirus has exposed the massive inequalities in our society. The fact that health care is not a right and that a lot of people lost their health care when they lost their jobs back in the spring and over the summer. And so I'm wondering if, if part of the reaction to this will be a major reform movement. Uh, of, um, of people all around the, around the country, maybe akin to what happened at the beginning of the 20th century, that our government needs to be stronger and that we need a bigger and stronger social safety net, particularly for the disadvantaged. And if you combine those two crises, crises, excuse me, with the most important crisis, which is the racial crisis and the lack of racial justice and the search for racial equality by African-Americans, by Latinx Americans, by people who are not in the majority of this country, but are every bit uh, the citizens that everyone else are, um, we've got to, um, I think, pick up from the energy in the streets in Seattle, in Boston, all in Austin, Texas, all around this country in the largely peaceful protests that happen led by young people, uh, people uh, like students at UW, like my students at Harvard, like my daughters. Um, and, and we've got to follow that energy and uh, take on the, the greatest problem we've had since 1619. And that's the fact that we've never fully uh, in, given rights to and incorporated African Americans as full citizens in this country. If you think about the, the interplay between the coronavirus and the economic crisis, and the racial crisis in our society, no country can be effective in its foreign policy if, if, it's, if it's divided at home and not stable at home. And there's no justice for a big part of our population in the United States. I actually think if it's, if it's Joe Biden who's gonna be elected, and I hope and pray it will be, that's the main mesh mission of a Biden administration. If President Trump returns, let's see. Uh, we should all just use our democratic rights, our voices to employ such an administration to do the right thing because they haven't done the right thing on racial justice over the last uh, four or five months in the streets of America. I wanted to start there because we do live in a glass house and it's a shattered glass house in a lot of ways right now. And when John uh, Koenig and I were diplomats together, we served together in both uh, Greece as well as at NATO you know, we would uh, routinely advise countries and reprimand countries privately or even publicly when they fell down on human rights standards. We would go after authoritarian dictatorships for the kind of things that we felt, um, you know, limited people's rights and didn't allow people to live free, uh, free lives. And now the shoe's on the other foot. We won't have a lot of credibility in the world if we haven't fixed our problems at home. So I wanted to start there. But certainly in terms of the transatlantic relationship, we have a lot of work to do. I'd start with, with three data points that the European Union is the largest trade partner of the United States, not China, not Japan, not India, nobody else. That the European Union is the largest investor in the American economy. And that NATO, Canada, and 28 American uh, allies are in, in Europe, that's the largest collection of American allies in the world. And so Europe really matters to the United States. I say that because you're all out in the Pacific Rim. I'm here on the Atlantic Rim <laughs> facing the Atlantic Ocean. And um, we're a big country. Our two cities are 3,000 miles apart. Both of these regions are going to be important to us. And there's no question, in my mind at least, over the next 10 to 20 years, more of our attention is going to have to be on the Indo-Pacific. More of our resources, economic, political, military as a government are going to have to be in the Indo-Pacific as we contend with uh, a rising and returning China to power, as we attempt to work with India and Japan and Australia and the Quad to limit China's power, as we seek uh, international redress for the problems of the South and East China Seas, as we try to compete with the Belt Road Initiative, as we try to keep the peace with China 
and work with China when we have to on climate change and uh, pandemics in the future. That's going to be the most important challenge in many ways, but it doesn't mean that what happens here in the transatlantic region is somewhat somehow not important. Because if you look at those three data points, our economic and our security ties are still not just in the Indo-Pacific, still very much centered on the Atlantic. Um, John and I served at NATO together. NATO has been an extraordinary asset for the United States since April 4th, 1949. Uh, it's been the expression of the United States of the lesson that we learned from the aftermath of the First World War and the isolationism in America in the 1920s and 30s, the inside of FDR and Truman and Marshall and Acheson and Dwight D. Eisenhower and John F. Kennedy and every president until President Trump, that America cannot be safe and we can't be secure and we can't be, um, we can't be successful in the world if we stay at home. And NATO was, 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 was the expression of the United States to be forward deployed, both politically and militarily in the NATO alliance. That alliance is now hurting. It's hurting because for the first time uh, in the 72 year existence of the NATO uh, alliance, the 71 year existence, excuse me, the NATO alliance, um, we don't have an American leader who says he believes in NATO. President Trump has fashioned himself to be the leading critic of NATO. Now I think both John and I would say, good for President Trump for suggesting that NATO allies spend at least as a floor, 2% of GDP on their national defense. That's their obligation. But the way he's gone about it, to be so exceedingly critical publicly of the allies, trying to humiliate them, it doesn't really work in an alliance of equals of democratic countries. And he hasn't even told the truth, actually, about what's happening. Because since 2015 on NATO defense spending, every single NATO ally has seen a real increase in their defense spending, some quite modest, some quite impressive, but since 2015, Right, right until now, 2020. Why is that? Because Putin invaded and occupied and annexed Crimea in 2014. And there was a big NATO reaction led by Angela Merkel and led by Barack Obama that we had to prepare the alliance to be stronger in order to have deterrence against uh, an expanding Russia and a Russia that's still in many ways threatened uh, our NATO allies, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, the three Baltic countries, as well as Poland. So for President Trump to go around for four years now and make a big deal about NATO spending more, I get that. I actually support the goal, but he's not really being honest with the American people in all these rallies that he holds, these super spreader rallies, by the way, uh, in a time of coronavirus against the advice of the CDC. I have to say that. He's not being very honest with the American people to recognize that the trend line is very positive. Right now, only 10 of the 30 allies exceed 2% of GDP uh, in defense spending. But by 2024, the great majority of the allies will be there. They've committed to be there, and most of them are on track to be there. And so this is a success story. And I think President Trump can take some credit for it, but so can President Obama. In a lot of ways, so can Vladimir Putin. Let's blame it on him. He's the one who instigated this big increase in NATO defense spending. What has actually, I think, been more troublesome, uh, Professor, is that um, you know we all know that NATO works on deterrence and that uh, our relationship first with the Soviet Union during the Cold War, now with Russia since 1991, has been all about deterrence. Deterrence doesn't work if, in this case, the President of the United States, the acknowledged leader of NATO, doesn't say publicly in a sincere, and convincing way that the United States will defend any of our NATO allies if they're attacked by Russia. And President Trump's had lots of swings at the bat. An infamous interview with Tucker Carlson on Fox News in 2018, when Tucker Carlson said, why are we in NATO? Why should we defend Montenegro, one of the new members of NATO? And Trump said, that's a very good point. When President Trump visited NATO headquarters in 2017 on his first visit to Europe, he was asked by his staff to say that Article 5, this is the linchpin of NATO, an attack on one shall be considered an attack on all, that President Trump agreed with that, that the United States would defend our allies. He failed to do it in the speech he gave at NATO headquarters that day, three and a half years ago. 
he has never articulated what Barack Obama and every president back to Harry Truman has said publicly because they've meant it, that this alliance depends on the absolute good faith of all of us, but particularly the United States. And so he, he has now left doubt in the mind of President Putin about whether the United States would actually honor our obligations under a treaty. It's a solemn oath to our NATO allies if they're, if they're attacked. Why am I so worked up about this? Because I was at NATO on September 11th, 2001, as a very new American ambassador. I'd just been there 12 days. And when we were hit very hard uh, on the morning of uh, September 11th here in the East Coast of the United States, I was six hours east in Brussels, Belgium at NATO headquarters. And I started calling when I saw what happened on CNN, the Twin Towers came down, all those people killed in lower Manhattan. And then of course the Pentagon literally attacked and people dead there and the building was burning. And then we saw flight 93 go down in Pennsylvania. I started calling, I called the State Department and the phone rang because the State Department had been evacuated. And of course the Pentagon was evacuated and the White House was evacuated. And my staff and I, and we have a joint mission of State Department and Defense Department, US military at NATO, as you would imagine in a military alliance, we deployed, we sat, how can we help? our brethren, our country, men and women in the United States. We couldn't get anybody on the phone in Washington. And then my phone started to ring. Canadian ambassador, David Wright. Have you thought about invoking Article 5 because Canada wants to help you? The German ambassador, Gephard von Molke, we're with you. Whoever did this to you will be with you in the fight. The French ambassador, Benoit Dabovio, the Polish ambassador, Jerzy Novak, I, the Dutch ambassador, Mikhail Patain, they all said the same thing in a series of phone calls over two to three hours. And by the next morning, every single NATO ally had pledged to go to war with us, had pledged to defend the United States against Al Qaeda. And I, I felt like I needed a little bit of adult supervision because we were gonna vote at NATO to invoke Article Time 5 for the very first time in NATO history. It had never been invoked before because Stalin never attacked. And Khrushchev and Brezhnev didn't because we had deterrence in place, because we had strong presidents. So I called back to Washington, spoke to my friend with whom I'd worked in a prior administration, Condoleezza Rice. She was the national security advisor. It was four in the morning in Washington. I said, Condi, the allies want to invoke Article 5. She said, go for it. I said, thank you. I feel I need, Condi, the president's personal permission, personal instruction that I should vote this way. This is a declaration of war. She said, go for it. She said, the president's had a really bad day. It's four in the morning and we want this to happen. I said, I'll take that as my presidential instruction. I'm gonna go down to room one at NATO and we're gonna vote to invoke article five. She said, one more thing. I said, what's that? She said, it's good to have friends in the world. And I've never forgotten that. And it, it really touches me deeply to think about it now, uh, 19 years later. Why? Because why would the United States, even as powerful a country as we are, why would we wanna be alone in the world? Why would we wanna be isolationist or unilateralist in the 21st century when we're facing climate change and we've all gotta be pulling on the same oar in climate change and get back into the Paris Agreement and do our bit. And we're facing in this case now an insidious pandemic and we can't succeed in the United States unless we're working on the vaccine and working on public health strategies with people around the world. We, we don't want to be have to take on deterring Russia and deterring China from militaristic and aggressive behavior um, alone. And what John and I experienced and John was the, our, our deputy chief of mission and then charge d'affaires uh, he led our NATO mission when I left uh, in 2005. We both know uh, in the core of our beings that we're so fortunate to have these allies. I see the NATO allies as the big power differential between the US and Russia. Russia has no allies. If Russia got in a fix like 9-11, they couldn't, who's gonna come to Russia say Belarus? Maybe, but Belarus is in turmoil right now. No one's dedicated to protect Russia. If China faced an existential crisis of the type, and I hope they never do, that we did on 9-11, who's gonna fight with China or stand up for them politically or just stand by their side? And that's the big power differential in the Indo-Pacific because 
Japan and South Korea and Australia are our treaty allies. And the Philippines and Thailand are our defense partners. And India is our strategic military partner. It's these alliances around the world that really magnify American power and they help the United States achieve what we need to achieve in the world. That was a compelling moment for me and a real big takeaway from my career that you wanna stand with others in the world, with other women and other men, and you wanna have people around you and you wanna be in common cause. You don't wanna be alone in the 21st century on any issue. And here's my indictment of President Trump. He doesn't get it. He doesn't understand collective defense. I don't think he feels any obligation to any of the NATO allies. He talks about them as if they're competitors. When they're the people who came to our rescue in 9-11, they suffered a thousand combat deaths the Europeans in, in Afghanistan over the last 19 years, several thousand Europeans wounded. And so it really anchors me, frankly, when President Trump tees off on them publicly. And he does it routinely. He does it as political rallies just to score points for his election. And it's wrong. You didn't see Barack Obama or George W. Bush do that kind of thing. They knew better. They knew the importance of treating people with respect. That's what you learn from your mom and dad when you're young. It's what you learn in kindergarten. That rule applies in diplomacy. And the way that President Trump has gone after Angela Merkel, it's misogynistic. She's stronger than he is, and she's smarter than he is, and she's more respected than he is in the world. I think if you took a secret vote uh, of the G20 leaders, and, they, and, the, and the question was, who do you respect the most? This is Modi and Putin, Xi Jinping. I think they'd vote for Angela Merkel. And he has done everything he can to tear her down, to try to diminish her publicly. He has just, it's, it's just criticism after criticism. And with Justin Trudeau, the same thing. And with Emmanuel Macron. So it's a very strange world. It's a surreal kind of Alice in Wonderland world when this president of the United States has been tearing down individual NATO leaders, failing to stand up to his responsibilities while he literally embraces Kim Jong-un and never says a bad word about either Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping. And those are our adversaries in the world. Those are the people, the countries competing with us in every way who are deniers of human freedom. And so, um, boy, we need to reinforce NATO and the Americans need to show up there and show a little respect for our partners and allies. And we need a president who will treat our allies with respect. That's very important. And the European Union is important. It's the other side of Brussels. It's the other side of the transatlantic relationship. I think all of you know, you've got the Jean Monnet Institute. You've got this big focus on Western Europe at UW. You know, it was the United States who through the Marshall Plan said, actually our aid between 1947 and 54, it's contingent on one thing. Here's the history of the Cold War. We don't want France and Germany to go to war again because they've done three times, 1870, 1914, 1940. We want you to integrate. And part of the condition of the Marshall Plan was form the coal and steel community in 1948. We cheered on and supported the Treaty of Rome in 1957. We supported the creation of the common market. We supported Maastricht and the single market, and Schengen, and the Euro, every president, Republican and Democrat. And then suddenly Donald Trump comes along and says, the European, he said this, the European Union was created to compete with the United States. And he never says a good word about them. And his entire policy has been a tariff war against our European allies. And so the president has failed in the transatlantic relationship. Uh, there's no trust in NATO in American leadership. There is even less trust in Brussels at the European Commission and the European Council of Ministers. And that's a big problem for us when on issue after issue, our security in the transatlantic realm, our ability to trade with our largest trade partner, our ability to work on climate change together. The president has taken us out of the climate change agreement and taken us out of the World Health Organization. And he's taken us out of the International Organization of Migration on the and the biggest refugee crisis since 1945. And we're the country that now says no, and the country that leaves if we don't get our way. And we've left the Europeans to face the Russians and Chinese alone. Who's the big voice on human rights in the world? It's Europe. Who's the big voice of conscience on climate and the environment? It's Europe. 
And so this relationship is in crisis. And uh, I know Joe Biden. I've known him for several decades. Uh, when John and I were at NATO together, we faced some really tough times during the Iraq war, big divisions in the alliance. Senator Biden came out for two days and sat with us and sat with all of our colleagues at NATO and he calmed the waters a little bit. He's been a longtime defender of the NATO alliance. And he's been saying in the campaign trail, I will put the United States back into a position of leadership uh, at NATO. I will work with the European Union. I was with him when he gave a speech at the Munich Security Conference a year and a half ago when he said all those things. And he said, you know, I can't remember the exact words, but you know, there's another America out there, not just Trump's America. And we actually believe in international engagement, that other part of America. And we believe in NATO and we believe in this transatlantic relationship with the European Union. It's terribly important we get this right because I don't, I don't know if you all saw the Pew poll that came out uh, last month, um, but the Pew poll showed that in allied country after allied country, there is greater public confidence in places like Germany and France and Italy in Putin and Xi Jinping than Donald Trump. You know you're in trouble when you're below Putin and Xi Jinping in the hearts of the, of the people of a democratic uh, country. So, you know, if, we, if we're able to build back better, if, if Joe Biden is able to win, if he can take office on January 20th, uh, early next year, uh, I think he'll be able to re-engage. They have confidence in him. They'll know it's sincere. We won't be able to resolve every problem because we don't agree on every problem. But if we can agree to work together on climate change, work to reform the World Health Organization and work together to help poorer countries during the pandemic, this next wave and year of the pandemic. That's the right thing for the United States to do. Um, I think there'll be a lot we can agree on. We'll have to figure out what we do in Afghanistan. We should talk about that, Professor, tonight. Because that's a big, big issue. I know the state of Washington has a lot of military bases. You have a lot of people who, have who I know have served from, the state of, from your bases uh, in Afghanistan as well as Iraq. What do we do with those two big land wars? How long should we stay? We don't want to throw the Afghan people, particularly women, uh, to the mercies of the Taliban, given everything they did to subjugate women and deny women even elementary rights, rights like going to school when they had power in Kabul before 2001. These are really complicated issues, but you need a president who can actually work internationally in an intelligence way, intelligent way, who's data-driven, who will actually listen to other people and respect their point of view, that's all ahead of us. I think the most difficult relationship, the issues in the transatlantic relationship, Professor, will be, we're not quite together on China, uh, not at all. In the United States, we're seeing Democrats and Republicans largely agree that we've got to compete with China, certainly for military predominance in the Indo-Pacific, we should talk about that. We need to compete on trade and prevent China from continuing to rip off the intellectual property or patents of American companies that are violating the World Trade Organization guidelines there. They should not be a developing country in the WTO. They should be treated like the mammoth economy that they are. They're a very advanced economy. So those are big issues. We're even competing in a, in a way ideologically. Xi Jinping has been saying since China climbed out of the coronavirus, Wuhan province and Wuhan city went back to normal. They had, a, they had an, a, a very impressive Chinese government effort, I must say. But he's been saying since then, this proves uh, the superiority of the authoritarian state system of the Communist Party over those democracies. He says, look at India, look at Brazil, look at the United States. They're the worst, the countries that have, have coped with this in the worst possible way since January, February. So we've got to almost compete for the hearts of minds of people around the world and defend the democratic system. But what's been happening there? Trump's silent on Hong Kong as Hong Kong's democracy has been smothered this summer. He's been silent on the Uyghurs. And John Bolton, who is not you know, a close buddy of mine, but I read his book that he uh, wrote about his time as national security advisor. He says that, that at the August 2019 G20 summit in Buenos Aires in Argentina, President Trump essentially told President Xi Jinping, I'm not gonna block you or even say a negative word about what you think you need to do in Xinjiang province against the Uyghur population. Imagine an American leader saying that, consigning more than a million people 
to modern day concentration camps, separation of families, separation of kids from their from their mother and father. That's what's happening. Forced, you know, people going forcibly trying to convince them not to be Muslim. That's what's happening to the Uyghurs. And yet our guy, our president is silent and he's even complicit in this. So these big problems of how to handle China, they're now been exported into the European American relationship. The EU is an unwieldy group. They operate by consensus. Some European countries are very tough minded about China, want to work with Australia, Japan, India, the US, not to fight China, but just to raise our voices on Hong Kong and on the Uyghurs, for instance, uh, defend India rhetorically uh, as China instigated a conflict along the Sino-Indian border uh, just this past summer, up high up in the Himalayas. And I think the Europeans are going to need some time to work out what do they do about human rights issues? Do they side with the US and Australia and Japan and India, or are they, are they equidistant between the Pacific Rim powers that I just mentioned and the Europeans? They, they, they're debating 5G. Australia, Japan, India, the UK, and the United States have all said no to Huawei. And frankly, in my mind, for good reason, because Huawei works for the Chinese government. And networks aren't going to be free and secure as long as Huawei owns them and runs them. But the Europeans are very conflicted on this, especially the Germans. Angela Merkel will be leaving power, unfortunately. I really admire her. But whoever succeeds her is going to be in instrumental in making this big decision. Will, will Europe decide, decide with the other democracies in the world, or will it continue to work with China in that very important realm? We're going to face big problems, regulation of tech companies. The EU is the biggest regulation, regulator of tech companies. That will be a big issue for the US and Europe digital services tax. There are a lot of issues we can discuss, but this relationship, I think, with the Europeans is at its lowest point, I think, in the modern post-World War II era. We had a disagreement over Suez in 1956. We had a big disagreement over the Iraq War uh, in 2003. I think this is the most serious disagreement because they're doubting our reliability now. They're even doubting our commitment to democratic values as they see what's happening. Um, and I'll just say this with the authoritarian mindset, mindset of President Trump. They wonder if he shares his, their values, our values, democratic values. That's as bad as it's ever been in the transatlantic relationship. I'll just say one more thing, Professor, and I think I've spoken long enough and um, but just try to maybe end a little bit in a higher hopeful note because I don't want to depress everybody. Um, I actually have confidence that we can rebound if we have the right leadership. We're a great country. We have great values. We have a lot we can offer the world. We just need good leadership right now. We need to get together at home. We need to stop considering, you know, I, I live in a blue state. And that shouldn't matter, that blue red, that red blue divide. You know, we're all Americans. We shouldn't be considering each other as somehow on opposite sides of a barricade. That takes leadership at the community level, at the university level, at the national level. And right now, the major leader is dividing us by race, dividing us. You know, he's, he, he routinely condemns the Democratic states and praises the Republican states. Um, if we can get a new leader, and if we can get behind that new leader, and, and try to work, have the two parties work together. I think they agree more on foreign and defense policy, certainly the two parties than they do on domestic politics. Let's start there. There's very strong Republican support in the Senate and House for NATO. There's very strong Republican support for what the Democrats believe in containing Vladimir Putin. Very strong support for the EU in the Congress of the United States, just not in the White House. So I think I'm hopeful about that that you could fashion some kind of bipartisan compromise, that we, that we should be together on the transatlantic relationship. And the final thing I'll say is uh, a quote from someone who grew up in Washington State, and that's General Jim Mattis. And he lives in Washington State, as you, as you all probably know. Uh, he's a friend of mine. We work together uh, at, at the Cohen Group in Washington, D.C., both of us very much part-time, and we've been We've been uh, addressing audiences together over the last six months, and he's got a wonderful way of talking about who we are. Uh, General Mattis says, he says, we have two powers in the world, the American people and the United States. The first power 
is the power of intimidation. And, and General Mattis will say, that's me, 41 years in the military, Marine Corps, we know how to do that. He said, but there's a greater power, much greater, and that's the power of inspiration. And that's our Constitution, as amended in the Bill of Rights. And that's the Declaration of Independence. That's our rule of law society. That's our immigrant society, multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious America. I think that's Martin Luther King challenging us to do better in the civil rights struggle. It's the young kids in the streets this summer protesting brutality and the you know, police brutality, protesting the lack of rights for African-Americans. General Mattis says that's actually the secret major power that the American people have in the world. And if we can show a little bit more of that side of us and not just the tougher side of us, I think we can bounce back. It'll take a while, but we can do it. And we have a role in the world and we need to play that role. And I think that's very much in line with our major goals towards our transatlantic allies. So thanks for listening. Um, I'm really looking forward to, you know, what do you think about this? What do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Please tell me if you disagree. That's how we learn in the classroom. And I'm happy, Professor, to take any questions as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Burns, for um, an incredible um, uh, and gripping talk. Um, I found the um, discussion of, of your experience during September 11th particularly um, just um, really, really gripping. And um, you raised so many issues which are so critical to us. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open this up to uh, questions uh, from uh, basically everybody um, around the country, possibly who's uh, who's um, live streaming. And the way we're going to work uh, work uh, work on this is um, people are going to text me the messages, so I will be looking down at my phone just so that I'm keeping track of the messages. I'm not actually um, doing anything besides covering your talk. I just want the audience to know that. But let me just begin um, again first by thanking you again for just a wonderful talk. And I'll just say before we start the Q and A that the University of Washington is a nonpartisan public institution that does not engage in public advocacy. However, the Jackson School upholds the highest standards for the freedom of expression, and that includes freedom of inquiry, debate, and critical public discussion, which includes um, very strong and impassioned uh, critical views of um, public policy and governmental policy. Um, and so I'll just start with that um, um, uh, context. Uh, uh, context um, for, um, for for the Q and A, and while we're um, while we're gathering the questions uh, via text, I guess I will just ask you one question to just start us off. Um, there's so many things I could uh, talk to you. My own work is on India, so I won't go in that direction. I think what you've shown us is how the transatlantic alliance is about in the entire world, and it's connected so deeply to domestic politics. And I guess I'll start us off by saying, by asking you, you know, in some ways it seems that what you've shown us, and I think what many of us know um, so powerfully is that it, in many ways, democracy is, um, uh, democracy, um, democracy is kind of on the election, is on, is on the ballot in a way during this election. Um, and, um, and I'm wondering in, in terms of how you see things post-election, let's say we have a hypothetical Biden administration, what would be the biggest damage uh, to the transit, transatlantic uh, alliance, which Biden would sort of face uh, challenges and sort of un undoing? So in terms of the rebound, what would be what would be the biggest challenge? Because I could imagine with the, the positive relationships he has, a lot of the leadership uh, relationships would, would could go, you know, could get healed. But there's so much underlying shifts which you're pointed to. So where where would you sort of hone in? Thanks, Professor. And, and by the way, I hope we can talk about India. I hope we can hear your views on India. It's a fascinating country. and It's a big, big strategic partner now of, of the United States. I think Vice President Biden, you know, he's got he has decades of experience with the Europeans and the Canadians and a lot of personal friendships that will help us if he's elected to bounce back. Um, but here's the answer to your question. I think it'll be relatively easier to bounce back with the governments because they want to work with us. They want to re-engage on climate change and they want us to be back in the fight on climate change. They want us to be back in on human rights. They certainly want to know that the United States is committed to NATO and a strong US-EU relationship. And you know, most of the governments, maybe with the exception of Hungary uh, and Turkey because they're authoritarian now, and they're not going to like a democratic government in the United States. I think most will bounce back pretty quickly. I worry about public opinion. That's the answer to the question. Um, we are in the depths right now in terms of uh, public surveys of how Europeans view us. And I understand why. 
uh, climate change is probably the biggest issue in many of the European countries, including in Germany, the most powerful country. And they and we left, and we're the second largest carbon emitter, really almost co-leader. It's an infamous group, you know, the United States and China as co-carbon emitters in the world. And so we basically told the Europeans when we left, you're on your own. Uh, we're going to take care of ourselves. We're not going to help you. I think there's a lot of bitterness. We have a, one of our three daughters lives in Berlin. She's been living and working there for three years. And, you know, through, through Caroline, uh, our daughter, you get a sense of how people think of you when you leave leaving in the middle of the pandemic. It's like leaving in the middle of the, of, it's like defunding the fire department in the middle of a fire. We left right in the middle of the pandemic. We're the largest funder of the WHO. The Europeans are very bitter about that. Third example, the Iran nuclear deal, which I certainly supported. I was George W. Bush's Iran negotiator. I very much strongly supported President Obama, what he did with the Iran nuclear deal in 2015. President Trump pulled us out uh, and then didn't replace it with anything. So now the Iranians are, you know, they can do anything, anything they want with uranium and plutonium. Um, our partners in that deal were France, Germany, and the United Kingdom. And President Trump is now threatening secondary sanctions on those three countries because they continue to trade with Iran, which was part of the deal to which we agreed. So imagine, so you imagine the, the bitter, the sense of bitterness. I think that's the bigger problem. And um, some Europeans have said to me, can we trust you, meaning you, the American people, you elected Donald Trump. And my answer to that is, well, let's see what we do on November 3rd, 2020. And I hope I'm right that the American people are going to reject Donald, Donald Trump and Joe Biden's going to win. I think if that's the heart of it. It's winning back the population. And, and as you know, in, a, in the democratic world, you've got to have the people with you. You just can't have relations with a government and figure that's enough. You've got to have the people with you. At least your credibility has to be intact. And right now, we don't have much credibility. I think you're showing us how important trust is. So we have a, a right. long queue of questions. Um, before I, I, I start with the first one, which is from your friend, uh, Ambassador Koenig, um, I'm just going to uh, tell the audience that when you open up the Q&A, uh, sorry, when you, um, when you um, are trying to uh, enter your questions, the chat is on the right side of the YouTube screen. And if you exit full screen, um, some of you, you'll, you'll basically find it. And also for the audience, if you hear a pinging sound, my apologies, that's my computer. Every time there's a question, <laughs> it's coming up as a, as a sound. So uh, from, from Ambassador John Koenig, um, he says, it's great to have you with us, uh, Nick. And he says, um, he's, it's a follow up on, on the climate change issue. He wants to know how does it, um, um, how would you, how would Biden or you work with Europe to achieve goals in the Pacific? On climate change. Oh no, he wants to. Uh, sorry, he wants to address climate change, and he wants to know how would you achieve the goals uh, in the in the Pacific. Oh, in the Pacific as well. Okay, both two questions. Yeah, two questions. Uh, My apologies. Uh, well, you know, it's interesting. Um, U.S. carbon emissions have been falling, not because of the Trump administration, but because of the the conversion of our economy away from coal towards uh, renewables and towards uh, towards natural gas. And it's really been. I mean, you've been leaders on the West Coast. Uh, California, Washington, and Oregon. Uh, we, we, we like to think in Massachusetts and nearby New York, we're leaders too. I mean, our five states are pretty similar uh, in our commitment to a clean environment. Our, we have a Republican governor here, Charlie Baker, and he is, you know, he is all in on climate change. And so I think we're in a period over the last three or four years now, Trump administration, our states have had to leave. Our governors have had to leave. So now we'll be so much better off with the president of the United States leading uh, and, Pre and Vice President Biden has said very clearly multiple times in the campaign trail, we will go back into the Paris Climate Change Agreement and the WHO. And you know, he wants us to join, rejoin the world and, and lead. So I think on climate, it's going to be difficult. Um, we're going to have to challenge China to meet its 2030 targets, India to meet its targets. India, China, and Japan are still building uh, coal-fired plants which of course is disastrous if you're interested in reducing carbon emissions. But you saw that Prime Minister Suga of Japan just came out Monday uh, to the diet and said that they have a goal of um, carbon net neutral by 2050, China by 2060. And Vice President Biden's been talking on the campaign trail 
he's got a very serious plan for a um, for a green, uh, clean, clean energy economy uh, by mid-century. We have to have goals, and you got to get people focused on the goals and industry focused on the goals. And so uh, I think that leadership is going to mean a lot. On John's second question on the Indo-Pacific, um, I think a lot of people think that the most difficult thing we're going to do, the most difficult challenge, will be to do two things with China. We know we have to compete. We don't want to go to war. That would be catastrophic. We have to compete with India, Japan, Australia by our side. Compete militarily, economically, ideologically. But we also know we have to live in peace with China. And on some of the big issues like climate and coronavirus and stabilizing the global economy, you know, you want to work with them too. You don't want to have just an entirely competitive relationship. So can we keep that balance? Because right now, if you take the temperature of most people in Washington, D.C., not the state of Washington, but D.C., there are a lot of, there's a lot of fire breathing going on about China and a lot of menacing talk, very combative talk. Steve Bannon says, let's decouple our economy from China's. I don't know how you do that with the five trillion links in our global economy. I don't know how you deconstruct that. I don't, I, it's not advisable. But obviously, you know, keep maintaining some kind of balance between competition, which might be in the ascendancy, and, and be warranted and cooperation that takes sophistication and good judgment and wisdom by the president and by the Congress. And we need that. So I'd, I'd say to John Koenig, Ambassador Koenig, that that's going to be very important. That's going to be a very important balance, balance for us to keep uh, in the years ahead. Thank you for that answer. So a little bit of a change of pace, uh, a couple of questions on Turkey. Um, the first is, uh, could you address, I'm going to read them all out and you can pick whichever point. Okay. Uh, could you address the challenge of Turkey? We have muddled through as best we could in a difficult relationship, but it's growing increasingly adversarial. How can we do better? Um, and then going off of John Koenig's question on uh, Turkey, how can we call NATO an alliance of democratic states when some of its members like Turkey are becoming increasingly anti-democratic? Boy, such good questions. I think there's no question. John, will, John Ambassador Koenig will have a view on this. Turkey's our most difficult ally right now, without question. If you think about what the Turks have been doing, they're, put, they're fueling the war uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh right now in backing the Azeris. They've been entirely, I think, vindictive um, uh, and unreasonable in dealing in Iraq. They have been deadly against the Kurds uh, in Syria. And we made a big mistake in reducing the very small American special forces president presence east of the Euphrates because we were helping to protect Kurdish civilians and they were protecting us. They were actually working, they were our best friends, the Syrian Kurds. And so the Turks are a problem there. They're a problem in Libya. They're certainly a problem on the S-400 air defense system because they've now not just purchased it, they've activated it. And from a NATO perspective, we can't hook up this, the S-400 to the NATO defense system. It's, letting, it's like letting a cancerous agent loose in the bloodstream. And so we've got to wall the Turks off for a while. That gets to the second part of the question, or the second question about NATO. NATO, like the EU, operates by consensus. What that means is any important decision means 30 allies have to agree. If even one ally says no, then NATO can't move forward. And so if anyone wanted to banish the Turks or expel them from NATO, the Turks would simply not give consensus, not agree, and it wouldn't happen. We have a little bit of history here. Between 1967 and 74, there was a Greek military dictatorship. They remained part of NATO, but the allied leaders at that time kind of sidelined them, didn't involve them in every big decision. Um, we had two Turkish military dictatorships of the 70s and 80s. The same thing happened. Can we push the Turks to the side? It's difficult. The Turks have the second largest military in NATO after that of the United States. They're very aggressive, President Erdogan. They're involved in everything in the Balkans. They're harassing uh, the Greeks uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean they're over, over disagreements over, over where the sovereign uh, maritime borders are in the Eastern Aegean Sea. They're harassing Cyprus, where John Koenig was ambassador, uh, and Greece and Israel. They're contesting the natural gas drilling rights 
of Israel, Cyprus, and Greece, and the Eastern Med, they're a huge problem in the world right now. And um, Erdogan has converted Hagia Sophia, uh, the magnificent Byzantine cathedral turned mosque, but since 1934, a secular institution, he's transformed it back into a mosque. And it's a very important place for Christians, especially Orthodox Christians in the Eastern Mediterranean. So he's a real problem. And Ambassador Lute and I, you referred to the NATO study that we did, we published under Harvard's auspices in 2019. We suggested that the NATO allies exact some penalties against Turkey, Hungary, because that's a dictator, it's an authoritarian government, and even Poland, which now is denying some elementary rights, press freedoms, for instance, judicial freedoms in Poland, that um, no NATO meetings would be held on the territories of those three countries that no NATO uh, funds should be given to support the militaries of those three countries. And as we went around and talked to people in Europe and in the United States, hardly anyone agreed with us. Uh, people just didn't wanna face this issue because it's hard. It's hard to pinpoint three allies, Turkey, Hungary, Poland, and say, uh, we're gonna put you in a corner. We're not gonna work with you fully in a democratic alliance, but your questioner is right. We have three allies particularly Turkey and Hungary, I would say more than Poland, that are no longer democracies. And that's a major problem for NATO. Thank you for that answer. Um, so I'm going to uh, take us back to Putin. And I'm going to give you two questions. Uh, and they come from different angles. So it'll be interesting to have them together, I think. The first is, um, how do you think our relations will change with Russia under Biden administration? Has Trump's free pass for Putin's interference in regional aggression left lasting damage? And the second is, if collective defense is better, why did Putin move against Crimea during Barack Obama's administration and not during Donald Trump's administration? Thank you very much. Very good questions. First, you know, I should say, um, I'm just went one of many, many, many people uh, trying to help out the Biden campaign, giving advice on foreign policy. And the last thing in the world I want to do is speak for Vice President Biden or try to anticipate what he might do as president. He hasn't even been elected yet. And so when I've been talking about Vice President Biden, I, I've been just uh, summarizing things that he said in the campaign trail that he's been very clear about climate change, WHO, NATO, US leadership and engagement, that kind of thing. But I really wouldn't want to anticipate, you know, he's going to have to decide with his new team uh, what he does on Russia. But I would say this, Vice President Biden's been a very strong defender of the NATO alliance, of its integrity and of Article 5 a very strong defender of the independence of Georgia and of Ukraine, both countries invaded by Russia, Georgia 2008, Ukraine in 2014. And, um, and I think Vice President Biden historically has been tougher, tougher minded. Uh, he is not afraid to stand up to bullies. And President Trump is actually very afraid because he hasn't stood up to anybody, bullies in the world, not Kim Jong-un, not Xi Jinping, not Duterte in the Philippines, and certainly not Erdogan or Vladimir Putin in Europe. So I think we know what kind of leader he would be. He would strengthen us because Biden, because he'd strengthen NATO and the US connection to NATO as well as the um, European Union. On Crimea, the reason why President Obama and Chancellor Merkel and the NATO alliance did not fight um, Russia over Crimea, which is sovereign Ukrainian territory under international law, is because we have no Article 5 security guarantee with Ukraine. Ukraine's not a member of NATO. Uh, we gave, and I was with President Clinton in Budapest in December 1994, when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons, because when the Soviet Union imploded in December 91, there were nuclear weapons left, not just in what became the Russian Federation, but in three other republics, which became independent states, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. And the United States negotiated the transfer of the nuclear weapons uh, from those three countries back to Russia. Why did we do that? We had a close relationship with Boris Yeltsin and a democratic Russian government, but we really felt that for nuclear stability, we would, um, our ability to diminish the risk of the use of nuclear weapons would be enhanced because they'd be in the territory of one country under the secure control of the Russians, not of the other three countries that didn't really have a history with nuclear weapons as independent states. 
and they didn't have the secure the secure means to store nuclear weapons. So that's why we did it. We did not give Ukraine security guarantees. We gave them what in international law is called security assurances. If they're invaded, we would support them rhetorically. We would want to take that issue to the United Nations, but we would not defend them militarily. The Ukrainians clearly understood this in 1994 when we negotiated this with them, and I was part of the team that negotiated that. Um, and they understood it in 2014. So the reason why President Obama didn't fight Putin uh, is because um, there was no security guarantee. Um, why did President? Why did it happen under Obama's watch? It happened really because Putin feared that the Ukrainian democratic movement was moving so fast that the people were rising up against Viktor Yanukovych, who was a corrupt Ukrainian leader, crony of Putin's, that Ukraine was really um, entering a strategic relationship with the European Union which Russia did not want. That's why he moved in late February, early March uh, of 2014. It really had not much to do with President Obama and a lot to do with the EU. And Putin feared he was losing control. The Russians are very paternalistic towards Ukraine. Of course, they trace the birth of the Orthodox Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, to Kievan Rus in the uh, 11th and 12th centuries. There, there's a tremendous degree of intermarriage between Ukrainians and Russians. They have almost always been together for the last thousand years. It's just in the last 30 that they haven't been. And so the Russians, this is a red line for Putin. That's why he invaded. I'm not excusing him, just trying to explain him. But Obama and Merkel led a pretty vociferous counter um, attack in terms of sanctions, not military, but sanctions. And President Trump has been quite weak. He's been campaigning to take the sanctions off Vladimir Putin, and Putin hasn't gotten out of the Donbass, where he has 8,000 troops, and he certainly hasn't gotten out of Crimea. So that's pretty, I would say the weaker president here is certainly Trump, not Obama. Thank you. So throughout your talk, it's been really interesting how you've made the connections between civil society and foreign policy. And the next question comes from Sabina Lang, who's um, the, our direct, faculty director of all the European Studies uh, Centers. And she, she says, uh, Pew reports that far more young Americans value our relationship with China than with, with, than with Germany. How can public attention be returned to the transatlantic alliance and democratic values? Well, you know, I think it's, I, I sense the same thing at Harvard and, and um, here in the East Coast. I think, you know, it's inevitably you see this extraordinarily successful economy high tech, very impressive innovation in China. We have a big transfer of students. You've got a lot of Chinese students at UW, we do here too. So it's, it's natural that young Americans would feel that China is a charismatic place and they wanna be there. And we certainly encourage our students to travel in China and learn Mandarin. And we, we very much value the presence of Chinese students uh, in our campus. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, that we shouldn't be concerned about um, what different what the differences between the United States and China, and I know the professor recognizes this. China is the major violator in human rights in the world today. Under Xi Jinping, the Communist Party has become infinitely stronger and more repressive. We've talked about the, the, the plight of the Uyghurs, the lack of religious freedom in China for those people who want to be religious, the lack of any kind of civil rights and civil discourse, and uh, the intimidation by, of, of neighboring countries on some of these issues by the Chinese leadership. I think the big difference, I would say to young people, I say to my own students, look, this is not a replay of the Cold War. It's very different than the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But maybe the difference here is between an open society and a closed society. If you want to live in a surveillance state, go to China. I was there a year ago with a Harvard delegation and my wife Libby was with me. She'd never been to China. And she just kept counting the cameras. Every park we walked through, we were in five Chinese cities, just thousands of cameras, surveillance society, the power of the state over the people. I would say to most, most young Americans don't agree with that. So it's one thing to wanna to, uh, cooperate and exchange exchanges of students, and that's all good, but we have to stand up for our values and the Chinese government not the people so much, but the government are antithetical to our values. And boy, the Japanese and the Indians and the Australians, uh, the West Europeans, they're with us 
uh, they want to make these distinctions between a democracy and an authoritarian society. And I know I've said a lot of tough things about the president, but we've got to make a big decision next Tuesday. He's not standing up for democratic rights anywhere in the world. I mean, do a word search on Donald Trump and democracy. You don't find many examples where he talks about human freedom. Ronald Reagan would be all over this if he were alive today. He'd be on the, he'd want to engage in a verbal, rhetorical comparison of our system versus the Chinese state system. So I guess that's how I'd answer a really good and complicated question. So I guess I'll extend, uh, uh, pick a question which extends the discussion on China because there's just there's so much emphasis on, on, on U.S.-China relations. Um, so somebody asks, um, please comment on China's Belt and Road I Initiative. What challenges and opportunities does it pose for, it, you, for the U.S.'s transatlantic and Indian alliances, especially in information and space technology ch supply chains? And maybe what I'll do is I'll also ask a broader question. I'll just tag a question of mine onto that, which is um, U.S. aid and development work was often tied to U.S. foreign policy. Um, and it seems that China is now, in, in a sense, doing that through, through infrastructural development. So what, how does that factor in? And I think the, the Belt and Road Initiative might be an example of that. So Thank you, Professor. Yeah, I'm, I'm teaching a course called Great Powers this semester. It's a graduate school course. We have 56 students from 19 countries. It's a fascinating course to kind of go around the world. And we're looking at the interplay among the great powers, Japan and India and uh, China and the U.S. and Russia, the EU, Nigeria, South Africa, Brazil, Mexico. And um, Belt Road has been a centerpiece of this course. And if you think about the fact that in many ways it might be the biggest idea in the world today. I mean, it's, it's the biggest infrastructure project in the world. There are more countries that are involved in it on every continent, including Europe. Italy is a member, part of the Belt Road Initiative right now. Uh, the Balkan countries, Latin, South and Central America, all Africa, of course. And um, China has more countries that are um, its leading trade partner. Uh, China is the leading trade partner of more countries than any other country in the world. They're using that network to integrate Chinese technology, Chinese capital with other countries. It's extraordinarily impressive. We all know the problems, long-term indebtedness of many of the recipients of Belt Road assistance. Are they gonna bankrupt some of these countries? China bringing in the labor to build some of these infrastructure projects where, as opposed to using the workers, the labor of the people of that uh, country. So a lot of problems with it. Some countries have turned against it. The Sri Lankans have had a very bitter experience, for instance. Um, and they're, they're going to be in long-term debt, the Sri Lankan government and people, uh, to the Chinese leadership. Uh, a student of mine did a comparison a couple of years ago and said, look, the Marshall Plan, 1947 to 54, and 2018 dollars, must have been two years ago, was uh, roughly $190 billion. Belt Road's already over a trillion dollars. So you can just, the scale of this is enormous. Last thing I'd say is, so I, I think the United States is right not to be part of it, mm -hmm. not to be part of an initiative that may be doing some good around the world. In some places, I mean, people are better off. Infrastructure, train systems, airports, roads, health clinics are being built. But the long-term indebtedness, uh, the lack of openness and transparency uh, financially by the Chinese government in running this, it's more about the Chinese than it is about the recipients. Uh, and I hope that um, in the next administration, why don't Japan and the European Union and Australia and the United States get together with our own kind of initiative, a global multinational infrastructure development plan without the indebtedness on better terms and take more interest in the people of the country the way, say, the World Bank or the IMF might do and compete uh, and see which, which, which system and which program turns out to be better for people in the developing world. Yeah. I think that's a challenge we should rise to. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I, I think what I'm going to do is I'm, connect, I'm going to connect it to a, a question I have about nationalism. And the questioner is asking, uh, can you say more about nationalism versus being closely allied with Europe? And why being allied means being safer? And I'm going to, again, take the privilege of tagging on my own question, uh, which is to ask you then, uh, in terms of, for example, you're saying that the U.S. should compete in this, you know, uh, infrastructural uh, um, 
pro uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, but the Americans are right now in a very sort of inward looking nationalist space. And so how would that complicate that sort of outward looking, you know, uh, right. global outlook? So um, yeah. the issue of nationalism generally is a question. Thank you very much. In, in my same Great Powers course, and I teach it usually once a year, and we've, we've really seen much more student focus and even in focus for me on this on this issue of nationalism. And in class, we talk about the difference between nationalism and patriotism. You know, it's, Americans are right to feel patriotic and we salute the flag. We play the you play the national anthem before Seahawks and Patriots games. You know, we're proud of our country. But that's just because we're proud of who we are and the values we represent our community. Nationalism is more perverse. It's more I'm better than you are. I'm so much better than you are, I might want to dominate you. That's nationalism. And we're seeing it in China. Xi Jinping is the first of the post-Mao Chinese leaders after Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao to be so aggressive in pushing out against the rest of the, uh, particularly in, in uh, the Western Pacific, uh, the South and East China Sea, the Indian Ocean, very aggressive. And there's that Chinese nationalism. Certainly Putin, when he invaded Crimea and gave this incredible speech to the Duma, it was a highly nationalistic speech that we Russians need to protect the 25 million Russians outside our borders. That was the, that's the irredentism. That's what Hitler said in the 1930s about the Germans living in Poland and the Sudetenland. So nationalism can be uh, perverse. It can be threatening. It can lead to conflict. Um, I deeply admire India. And you know probably a lot more in India about India than I do, Professor, but I worry about Hindu nationalism by the BJP, second largest Muslim population in the world. And suddenly they're made to feel like second class citizens. That's not good for India. It's not good for social stability in the future. Finally, I never thought I'd say this as an American. I worry about us. Are we becoming overly nationalistic in the United States? Um, and, and that's why I'm so interested in a, as a diplomat, former diplomat, in um, our international engagements mm -hmm. and making sure that we're working on an equitable basis with other countries around the world, particularly our democratic allies. So that's a big subject. We could probably design an entire course at, your, <laughs> at the Jackson School and at the Kennedy School uh, around nationalism. It would be an interesting thing uh, to do. I don't know if I answered that person's question, but that's how I... Was there a codicil? There was a was there a caveat there that um, a part of the question I didn't answer? Uh, no, that was that was the question. So we're getting I'm getting these on my little text scre uh, screen with text. So they're coming in sort of cryptic um, uh, questions. But let me tie. Let me just build on that because you're everything you're saying is is dovetailing with questions that I have. So there is actually a specific question on on India. Um, and, um, and I fully agree with you in terms of the challenges that are being posed. And there's a deeper discussion maybe to um, to be had about what is happening in formal democracies like India or Brazil and the United States in terms of formal versus substantive democracy. But that's kind of, again, probably another <laughs> whole semester's uh, discussion. Right, right. Yeah, but the question is, um, in defending allies, how do we balance international strategic concerns and moral considerations should we only reprimand, uh, reprimand ethnic cleansing when committed by enemies? And the examples are India and Turkey. Which the, uh, oh, I think there. this is one of the most difficult yeah. judgment calls that, that any administration can make. And we, we saw this during the Cold War mm -hmm. when a lot of our allies were authoritarian dictatorships, but they were allies against the Soviet Union, the Shah of Iran, Marcos in the Philippines. Turkish and Greek military dictatorships, but they were our guys. And so you didn't see the Nixon administration, for instance, didn't elevate human rights very much and, and really wanted to judge countries, are you loyal to us? Are you in the struggle with us? But then they wouldn't criticize them on these major defects in terms of human rights. It's a real difficult issue. Every president brings a different sensibility to this. I think in my own experience, I started as an intern uh, with the State Department of my government career in 1979-80. And that was the Carter administration. President Carter, uh, extraordinary man, uh, you know, still living and very much alive and working at age 95. He deeply valued human rights and he weighted it much more strongly than other presidents uh, certainly did. Uh, certainly Barack Obama uh, and, and George W. Bush 
had a deep interest in human rights. Uh, a lot of students might not appreciate that about George W. Bush. They might appreciate it about President Obama. So it really depends on the administration. Mm -hmm. I think as a general rule, it's when you're working with a democratic country that's fallen, that's acting in a way that's contrary to its interests, I think one of the unwritten rules of diplomacy is sometimes quiet discussions behind the scenes are more effective than public bashing. Uh, President Trump has a big megaphone. He likes to kind of hit people between the eyes. You sometimes have to do that in international politics, but more often than not, a quiet dialogue where you're not trying to sink the other person or government politically, you might get your way more. But but you do have to weigh this, and, and you're right to focus on India. Um, I was very involved in the development of our strategic relationship with India, and I still go there. Well, pre-pandemic, I used to travel to India a couple times a year. And um, my Indian friends are furious with me when I criticize Prime Minister Modi or the PJ, BJP over Kashmir or over treatment of Muslims in Indian society. Um, and so it's difficult. This balancing act is difficult. You have to figure out when can I be most effective. And sometimes you have to speak out. Like right now, Americans have to speak out on Hong Kong. We shouldn't care what the Chinese government says. We have to speak out on Taiwan. That's a free democratic society. And we ought to be standing up rhetorically at least. You know, and we should also have military assistance to the Taiwanese to help them defend themselves, uh, to make themselves a tougher nut, uh, as the Chinese might think about a military invasion of Taiwan. So sometimes you have to be vocal. And, and there are other times when you might be more effective by being uh, going through the back channels. And it really depends on who you're dealing with and who you're working for in the White House. President Trump, democracy, human rights, not his thing. You don't see him pushing those issues, unfortunately. Thank you for that. So I think you're, you're um, nicely sort of talking about the public versus the private side of, of um, foreign policy. And so I'm going to ask you a question with, with a little bit of a twist on that, which is uh, um, pushing a little bit more um, on, on some of the things you're saying. Um, it's someone who emailed a question, so I want to make sure, uh, sure that uh, I, I read it out because uh, the person really wanted it uh, read. Sure. Um, the person said, uh, I would love if, if the speaker could address an issue in an article I read recently. The central point was this, in foreign affairs, popular does not mean effective. The writer portrayed President Obama as popular around the world, though weak, and President Trump as unpopular, though effective at protecting America's interests. Clearly, that's a broad brush, but is it also a fair distinction? The article listed accomplishments like these for President Trump, improved NAFTA, got Middle East peace talks, and asserted stronger stance with China? Thank you very much. I think it's a really good question. I think it's a fair question to ask. I don't think it, I, I, I think a leader can be both popular and effective. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, mm -hmm. Dwight D. Eisenhower, mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan, two Republicans and one Democrat. Leaders can be popular and ineffective I think, uh, on balance, I deeply admired, still do, President Obama, but he had his weaknesses. He made a big mistake, I think, on Syria in not hitting back when Assad used chemical weapons twice against the Syrian people. Uh, and so there are things to criticize in an otherwise very good record. Uh, I do think President Trump has done some things well. Uh, I think uh, President Trump had the courage to call China on the carpet on its unfair trade practices. Uh, he, I think President Trump was right to try to negotiate with Kim Jong-un. It was, that wasn't the diplomatic playbook. You know, you're supposed to start at a lower level, but Kim has all the power and I think Trump recognized that. And so it didn't work out, but he was right to try. But I wouldn't say that he's been effective with China. I don't think this trade war has really done much for the United States. And in fact, when President Trump really should have stood up to the Chinese, it wasn't on just asking for, I'm glad he did ask for the Chinese to buy more American agricultural products. That helps the state of Washington, it helps the Midwest. But he didn't go after the systemic problems. China's attack on intellectual property, China's use of espionage against American companies, 
uh, China's violation of patent agreements. President Trump didn't pull the trigger, and he should have. He hasn't been effective. On the Middle East, it's very positive that Bahrain and the UAE and now Sudan have recognized uh, Israel. Very positive. And, and that's a coup for President Trump. But it has done nothing to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is the raging conflict in that particular part of the Levant of the Arab of the Middle East. In fact, it's probably worsened it because President Trump has cut all USA to the Palestinians, all aid to the refugee camps, and um, really been the most one-sided American president since 1948 in that struggle. Not very effective. Uh, and so, and I think the most ineffective thing he's done is to alienate us from our allies in Asia and particularly in Europe. So um, I think the question is very fair. And you're right to ask about this link between popularity and effectiveness. But I wouldn't say President Trump has been effective, except for those isolated incidents in his foreign policy. I think he's been very weak when it counts against China and Russia. Thank you so much for that thoughtful question. So I'm going to end with one last question. And I'm going to end with the last question from your friend, uh, Ambassador John Koenig, uh, as a special thanks uh, to him for bringing you here. Um, so he asks, how do we make multilateralism more effective? You mentioned the constraints of consensus in NATO and EU, and the EU. Has this undermined their legitimacy, and what can we do? Well, I think there are times when countries have to kind of act alone. There may be isolated times, so we shouldn't always say that everything has to be subordinated to the UN, to some committee. And uh, sometimes you have to stand up for your own country and um, and maybe stand with just a few friends. But for the most part, I would agree uh, with John's question, and that is that we're heading into a period of time when many of the greatest challenges faced by the United States do not lend themselves to isolation or unilateralism. Climate change, it needs 195 countries to work together. Pandemic, 7.7 .7 billion need to work together. P people need to work together. Uh, international crime and drug cartels and human uh, trafficking rings, you have to work by definition with other countries. And so the United States is going to have to lead more diplomatically. Of course, the military and intelligence communities are vital for us. But I think if you look at that list of issues, those transnational issues, that's what's ahead of us in this decade and the next. We're going to have to learn how to form coalitions and work with others in multilateral organizations, most of which we invented like NATO and, 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 and own that role and be effective in that role. Um, it's not always, you know, kind of a John Wayne world where the sheriff can come into town and just shoot up the bad guys. In the 21st century, you need a lot of people on your side. And we have this ability to attract countries if we're respectful, if we are not uh, arrogant in the way we deal with them, and if we're not isolationist and just refuse to join organizations if we all, if we sometimes don't get our way. And that's what President Trump has done with the WHO. It's, done, it's what he's done with the United Nations, what he's done on climate change, what he's done on immigration and refugees. And so um, I think that John's right. We're going to have to be working in coalitions and partnerships much more in the future than we have in the past. But Professor, if I can just end on a high note and say it's been a, such a pleasure to be here. I don't want to end and have people feel depressed about the future of humanity. So at the end of every course that I teach, I ask my students, I, I email them and say, tell me what you're hopeful about. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me what you wish for, like the world peace forever. That's nice, but it probably won't happen. But analytically, are there hopeful global trends that we can push forward on together as a human community? And invariably, last in May, it came back the student poll, hopeful about poverty alleviation around the world historic alleviation of poverty, hopeful about global public health, not the pandemic, but certainly the eradication of polio, which is imminent. Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates, Washington, think that malaria can be eradicated uh, in their lifetime, in the next 20 years. There's a, HIV is now more of a chronic disease than a deadly illness. Uh, my students very hopeful about gender equality, hopeful, but probably not optimistic, about racial equality in the short term, but determined to do something about it. Hopeful about technology, another big Washington, Massachusetts connection, because we're high tech states, both of us. 
And I wanted to end there because my students and I talk about the fact that in international politics and government in Washington, we spend almost all of our time defending against the things that can kill us. And you have to defend against the things that can kill us. But we need to reserve more time to push forward these hopeful trends that can improve human life and improve the world. And I get a lot of inspiration from the students uh, who think in these terms. And I'm sure your students do at UW. And I wanted to end on that more positive note because we've talked a lot about, about a lot of tough issues tonight. And I thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you so much, Ambassador Burns. And I think your light, your your professional and service record is itself inspiring to all of us. I'm sure the audience found this uh, incredibly rich um, and inspiring. And um, I'll just end and conclude by thanking you um, for a wonderful discussion. Thanks, Professor. All best to the Jackson School. And I just want to salute my friend, Ambassador Koenig, one more time. Thanks very much for the invitation.